Dear all, wherever you are, welcome uh, in this second webinar from uh, Energyville, uh, also based on a what we call an expert talk. Uh, we will have uh, two experts today, one being uh, Tom, Ar Tom Arnaud, uh, Arnaud, who is going to talk first, and then Bart Vermang. And uh, as a general thing, to, just to uh, that you know, you are muted uh, by the organizers. Uh, if it's not the case, maybe please ask you not to interrupt the speaker and uh, mute your microphones. But the questions can be asked in the chat area and of this meeting, and we have foreseen the Q&A at the end of the webinar, where we will cover as many questions as possible. But uh, if you would have additional questions after the webinar, and you did, your question did not get covered, don't uh, hesitate to contact communications at energyville.be, and we will uh, really try to accommodate your question, send it over to Tom and Bart, uh, so you get an answer, you get more information, whatever you like. There is a video recording of this webinar. It will be made available online. Uh, next to the expert talk of Tom Arnaud, which was already previously published online. So all the information uh, is there, and we thank you really to join this webinar, because we think that this is the, a very interesting way of uh, passing our message to the general community, to the interested people, as we did on the COVID impact on the electricity demand and on the electricity system. So now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce to you Tom Arnaud. Arnaud, he is uh, R&D manager, thin film at uh, PV at Energyville IMAC, and he has uh, initiated research on thin film at IMAC in already last century, 1999, and uh, he's uh, record holder for several things with thin film technology, uh, and now he's working on perovskites. Uh, he will give an introduction of the potential of perovskites, because that's the general uh, element in this whole thing of this lunch webinar. Really, perovskites are the material of the future, and I would love to see now Tom getting ahead and showing the presentation and inform us about perovskites, their combination with other materials, and then Bart will give us uh, a next step in the future of what is going to happen. Tom, the floor is yours. Yes. Welcome to this Energyville webinar, where I will talk about next generation solar cells based on perovskites and how these perovskite materials can be used and implemented in new tandem technologies. It's only quite recent that perovskites are being used for solar cell applications, as you can see depicted here, and as it was shown to be a breakthrough technology in 2013. So only a few years ago, let's say, actually this started to become a PV material. In these few years only, actually, this material has made a very rapid improvement, though, on the performance and efficiency in solar cells, as you can see in this graph. This is an NREL chart which is being kept for several years already, uh, showing the best reported efficiencies of uh, very different types of solar cell technologies. And when we zoom in in this part, that's where also the perovskite are coming up. And this curve indicates that since what I mentioned around 2013, first results showed up of full perovskite solar cell devices. And only in a few years time, it really increased up to more than 25% of efficiency nowadays. This is, however, to be noted that this is only on small area cells and that is uh, with a specific architecture for these solar cells. Nevertheless, it is shown that this is really a very promising material system to be used for solar cell applications. 
Not only on the rapid increase of efficiency, this technology is rather remarkable, but also on other aspects. And for example, when looking at the uh, cost of the electricity generated by these solar cells, given that the module efficiency is sufficiently high, but even from 12% on, and the lifetime of the modules is also sufficiently high, but even there, 15 years would already be sufficient to have an electricity cost of only a few cents per kilowatt hour. In addition, the energy that you have to put in to make these devices and these uh, solar cells uh, is rather easily paid back by the generated electricity by these solar cells themselves. In just a few months or weeks time even, it can be uh, really generate already the energy back uh, for the energy that has been put into it. So that's also a remarkable situation compared to other PV technologies. These promising perspectives have, of course, initiated also some ideas to commercialize this technology. And here is just one example of a European startup. In 2014, Sol Technologies started to work on a specific technology, inkjet printing, to make perovskite solar cells and modules on flexible uh, foils. And they envisage that a lot of uh, different applications can be uh, demonstrated and, and worked out with this perovskite uh, solar cell technology and actually that it could be implemented almost everywhere. They have built further on their technology and uh, have already a uh, production capacity of 40,000 square meters and are currently uh, ramping that up with new investments and uh, new setting up of equipment to go even to a capacity of 200 square meters. This is just one example worldwide. There are many different uh, examples also of startups, both in Europe, in US, in China also. Uh, the, so this uh, technology is really trying to get onto the market. But is it ready, really, already to go to the market? That's what we will discuss also further on in next slides. To judge on this, I like to show, of course, which are some of the remaining challenges uh, that are left to make sure that this technology is ready to go on the market. Let's first start to look at what are we talking actually about, because perovskites is a class of material which is very broad and it uh, refers to a class of certain crystalline materials that has the same crystal structure as calcium titanate. And this material actually was found and described by Perovsky already more than 150 years ago when he found that in the Ural Mountains. But this is, of course, not the type of material that we talk about now for PV applications. For PV applications, we typically talk about organic, inorganic metal halide perovskites. A long name just to say that in this crystal structure, there are specific types of materials that are being used to assemble the perovskite. And there are organic materials like uh, metal ammonium or formamidinium, which have these structures, or but also cesium and rubidium can act as one of the cations at the corners of the crystal structure. There's other cations which go into the center of the structure where lead, tin and germanium, so typically metals go there. And then there are the other anions, which are typically halides like iodide, bromide, chloride, that go in between to stabilize actually the crystal structure with these positions here. The size of these uh, atoms or molecules uh, matters to make it a stable structure, but also the fact that this combination of materials uh, makes it a semiconductor and also that it absorbs individual, individual spectrum. So that's why these materials uh, start to be useful for PV applications for solar cells. The next step is then how to make a nice uh, smooth layer of perovskite material that can absorb the light and that then also can convert this light into electricity. Typically, this is done by combining a precursor, a lead halide, for example, with this organic uh, halide material into the effective perovskite uh, film. 
This can be done in different ways, by making it in solution and do spin coating of it, or by making a first layer with the first precursor material and then dipping it into a reaction where the second precursor material is available and the perovskite film is being formed. This is based on solution processing. There is, however, also the option to work in a, a evaporation chamber uh, under vacuum where one precursor uh, is evaporated and the other one also, so that they meet on the substrate and that the perovskite is formed there. So many different ways are available and possible to make these perovskite uh, films. And therefore, this is also part of technology development to really control these making of these layers with these different technologies in the best way. As I mentioned before the, uh, and shown in the NREL chart, making these layers and these perovskite materials on small area devices has already been very successful. And so these 25% efficient devices have been made. However, this is not the way how we want to use it in the end. We want to use it on larger area, square meters, for example, and then other techniques have to uh, be put in place. Like, for example, what we develop also is to use an ink in a slot die head, so that you can really smear it out over a big substrate and therefore cover larger areas. The other aspect is then that small area cells uh, have to be converted into these larger area devices, but there you need to interconnect a single cell, which is depicted here on a glass substrate with some contact layers, the perovskite absorber and some other contact layers, such that on one side you can extract the electrons and on the other side you can extract degenerated holes, that these small area cells have to be interconnected with each other on such a substrate into what we call a module where multiple cells next to each other are connected with each other in this way where the top electrode of one cell connects with the bottom electrode of the next cell this is done by laser processing to make these openings such that these are very narrow only about 20 or 50, nano, uh, 50 micrometer for example and these layers in the stack are only below one micron thick in total so this is really a thin film technology where also very narrow areas are used to interconnect one cell uh, with the other such that the losses in between are minimized all these steps which are needed to make these layers and to make these interconnections are available uh, on Energyville and that's also what we develop and work on to make this uh, not only just very efficient cells but also very efficient modules so with these interconnected cells on larger area substrates so making high efficient modules is also a matter of controlling the deposition on large area of the different layers in the stack as well as controlling the interconnection we use many different uh, techniques to study how the deposition method and also the crystallization method meaning the annealing and drying step after the deposition impacts the homogeneity of the layer where spin coating can have different effects than blade coating also dust and particles which are actually in the ink in the solution can have an impact and really even very small can uh, uh, decrease the performance or uh, really deteriorate the performance of the final uh, module and similarly for the interconnection also there imperfections in the openings or uh, debris at the edges of certain uh, cuts by the laser can have an impact on the uh, performance and therefore all of these are certain loss mechanisms that reduce the performance from a small area cell when you go to a larger area module this is then also what we further investigate on our site and here you can see that by introducing these larger area coating techniques like blade coating and slot die coating we really can go from small area devices up to nowadays already 30 by 30 centimeter square modules so it's really which is already quite considerable size of, uh, of module that we can make with these kind of tools and of course with these people uh, um, working on this technology 
You can see, however, that there is still some drop in performance and efficiency when you go from this small area to these larger area devices. So this is continuously work still to be improved such that the efficiency also here on this end of the curve still goes up to reasonable and usable efficiencies for uh, applications where you want to put these perovskite modules. Another aspect which I mentioned before is to make sure that the operational lifetime of the modules as we make them can be of course uh, long enough and uh, if you remember in the previous slide talking about 15 years, 20 and 25 years to become comparable with what is currently expected from PV technologies based on silicon. In our collaboration in Salience with the Dutch Institutes TU Eindhoven and TNO, uh, we have been working on a packaging technology and also optimizing the stack of the modules such that we can show that actually the uh, stress tests that we have applied to this, like light soaking for more than 1000 hours or damp heat, meaning that you put it at 85 degrees in a humidity of uh, 85% also there for 1000 hours or thermal cycling where you cycle up from very low to very high temperatures for more than 50 cycles that we see that in all these uh, situations the modules uh, maintain their performance uh, to a very high level up to 95% of the initial performance is been maintained which indicates that very good progress is made also in this domain of stability. There's of course also there room for improvement and further uh, adaptations to the devices such that we can actually also make sure that other type of uh, tests uh, we can uh, sustain. So in essence, very good progress has been made on upscaling the uh, perovskite solar cell technology up to modules and also the stability has further improved. However, room for improvement, as you could see with the module performance, is still there. And also trying to translate this uh, progress uh, on glass-based uh, modules into flexible modules uh, on plastic foil and so on is still work that needs to be further developed. Another very interesting uh, aspect, however, for the perovskite technology is that it can also be combined with other PV technologies and there boost the overall performance of these uh, technologies. This is because if we go back to the composition of the perovskite material, that by playing around with the composition and then specifically or more specifically with playing around with the halides, so the iodide and bromide, for example, as given here, you can really tune the band gap and so play with the color, the absorption spectrum of the perovskite material and you can really tune it over a very broad range. And this, of course, allows to also play with the potential applications but also with how you can combine it with other PV technologies. Why would you would like to do this combination of other PV technologies? That is to make more efficient use of the solar spectrum, the very broad solar spectrum that comes in and to make uh, more efficient use by making this combination of a perovskite cell in this case, for example, on top of a silicon bottom cell. The mechanisms behind this are a little bit explained here, where you can see that for a certain band gap, let's say for the silicon uh, solar cell uh, material, you have a certain band gap where part of the light is very efficiently absorbed part of the light which has wavelengths uh, into the infrared and red and therefore energies which are too low to cover the band gap they are not being absorbed the other part of the spectrum however with high uh, energy photons can be absorbed but the uh, electrons are um, excited to too high states and therefore thermalize back to this ground level here and so these is a thermalization loss and to remediate for this type of loss, that's where you can start to combine materials on top of each other, because then a certain material would be 
very efficient in absorbing a certain part of the light and another material could be efficient in absorbing another part of the light. Therefore, a wideband gap absorber on top of, in this case for the silicon, can really help to minimize these type of thermalization losses. And that's where it becomes important or interesting to indeed make this tandem combination. From calculations, you could see that if you use a bottom cell uh, here like silicon with uh, a band gap around 1.1, and then you can use a top cell in this combination with uh, band gaps of around 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, you can already have very high efficient devices and really crossing uh, more than 40% of efficiency uh, in theory, of course. And so um, this combination of these materials, therefore, could be very interesting, at least if you have a good material for the top cell. And that's where a low cost wideband gap material comes in, which the perovskite is. It's for the first time actually that also this uh, combination, being low cost and wideband gap, can be found in one type of material. And that really gives perspective to the silicon solar cell technology where many different technological improvements have made possible to continuously increase the performance of the silicon solar cells but actually it is uh, flattening off each time and also here um, cost effectively making all these technological improvements has been a challenge and now the next step which also the silicon cell technology um, and manufacturers see is to make indeed this combination with a tandem uh, uh, in peros with perovskites in a tandem uh, stack There are different types of how you can stack a perovskite cell on top of such a silicon bottom cell in this case. If we talk about silicon, there's other bottom cell materials that could be used, but here we focus on the silicon. And you can really mechanically stack the perovskite uh, cell on top of this uh, bottom cell. This means, however, that you need also a very transparent top cell with also the possibility to extract the current from that cell separately from the current uh, of the uh, bottom cell. So also here a transparent um, electrode needs to be put to make sure that sufficient light goes in, but also that it's conductive enough to collect the current here. This means that you could have some more parasitic absorption here in this electrode and also that you have more exterior electronics needed to operate both devices separately. On the other hand, it's a benefit that you can independently fabricate and optimize the subcells and you can also just mechanically quite easily stack them on top of each other. So there's pros and cons for this approach. We have been working on this uh, approach already for some years where we combine a small area perovskite cell on top of a silicon solar cell. In this case, it was an IBC, so a back contacted silicon solar cell of about 23%. But putting the perovskite on top of that, we could boost the performance with more than 4% up to 27.1%, which is still the best reported four terminal tandem combination of uh, perovskite with silicon. In line with what I explained beforehand, it's of course not a matter of just using small area cells, it's a matter of using larger area cells and then perovskite modules with several subcells come in there. But also this we have demonstrated to be successful and to boost the performance still uh, beyond the performance of the silicon cell alone. Another potential architecture for a tandem is to directly on top of the silicon cell, uh, you process the perovskite cell. It means still a transparent electrode here, but it doesn't have to be uh, 
collecting laterally the current, so the conductivity and transparency uh, ratio can be optimized to make it more uh, transparent and less conductive. So there's less parasitic absorption losses here. Also, you only connect on two sides, on full top and the full bottom of this stack, so only uh, less uh, electronics are needed to collect the current. However, it is a serious connection that you make of these subcells because actually you do not operate them separately, but they are connected with each other in series. And then it's important that the current is matched of the, the current generated in the bottom cell and in the top cell is matched with each other because if one of them would generate a lower current than the other, then it's the lower current that determines the overall current collection that can be uh, taken from this tandem. Also, in silicon cell technology, typically a highly textured front surface to optimize the capturing of the light into the silicon cell is being used. And these textures are typically uh, several microns high, three to five microns high, whereas the perovskite cell itself is less than a micron thick. So it's really important to make sure that you well conformally can grow your perovskite on such a highly textured uh, surface in this two terminal combination. So that's definitely a challenge still, and that's also where we are currently focusing on to make this happen. Another uh, point here to mention is that looking back at the graph previously shown is that for single junction perovskites, uh, as I mentioned, 25% of efficiency is achieved, but the tandem technology really kicks in here and boosts the efficiency of the, uh, the solar cell technology used with several percentages. And recently um, it was reported that more than 29% could be achieved. And in this case, with a two terminal tandem uh, of perovskite on top of silicon. The thing is there to be mentioned, which I uh, was showing before, is that the silicon here has been flattened, polished, such that uh, the processing of the perovskite could be done in a somewhat more easy way than on the textured surface. Very successful here in the uh, performance, of course, so close to 30%, and it's uh, expected that this 30% barrier will be broken in a few years from now. But the question is still there also, how can it be scaled up and really commercialized? So how do we get the tandems out of the lab? Again, there's uh, very good results achieved on small area uh, devices, uh, very promising there, but how to deal with that on the larger area? And that's the challenge that we are uh, trying to, uh, to take uh, in, this, in this technology. As I mentioned, industrial silicon cells typically have a textured surface, so the deposition uh, of the perovskite on top of that textured surface is really a challenge. The example shown of this 29% is where you have a polished front surface of the silicon cell and the perovskite can then be processed on that flat surface. And that was uh, shown to be already very, um, uh, very, very, very efficient. However, this additional steps of making the, the polishing of the silicon cell is not really commercially relevant. It is too expensive. You could still think to boost the efficiency of such uh, approach by adding some texture on top of the, uh, the stack. But again, this is adding even more steps and so commercially uh, even less relevant. It can boost and can show maybe on short term for small area devices to break this 30% boundary but it is not the way to go for commercialization. And therefore, as I said before, this texturing and how to conformally deposit the perovskite on such texture is really the next challenge to take. We are working on that by introducing 
a combination of evaporation, so evaporating some precursor material of the perovskite, and then in a second step only to use solution processing. Because if we would use the conventional solution processing as we do for the large area modules, we really are not able at this point to make it conformal. Here, however, you can see successfully how we deposited this thin layer of only less than a micron thick of perovskite on top of these very steep and high pyramids of several microns. So the deposition of the perovskite has already been very successful. And now it's, of course, a matter of really making working tandem devices. And that's a work in progress. And that's uh, something that we hopefully can report on in later sessions. In the next step, and also that we are already exploring, is that if we are able to make small area tandems on such textured surface, we also want to make it on larger area and also make sure that electrically we can connect these uh, cells as with conventional silicon cells with some bus bars or fingers, which can be printed like with silver paste or other methods that we are uh, have already developed for silicon uh, technology, such that also here we can make full-size uh, modules. And if this is successful, then we can really think about how we can move over uh, to uh, applications and integrate these uh, modules into different types of applications. This is what we envisage also for the next coming years that we will work also on the integration of these applications, for example, on the roofs or other parts of cars to put these tandem technology uh, up there. But also on buildings, on facades, uh, this tandem technology could be integrated if of course it can be fully upscaled and made fully reliable. And afterwards, also, if we can do that and we can show that also the tandem technology is really low cost, it can go into utilities, so solar parks. And there, actually, bifacial silicon solar cells could be used such that not only on the front side, the light comes in from the sun, but also reflected light on the back side can be used. And the efficiency, therefore, or the power generation, therefore, can even be further uh, improved and more uh, energy can be or electricity can be generated this is as you can see however a longer term roadmap that we really want to make to come through but there's a lot of work still ahead of us if you would like to have more information on perovskite and the european initiatives on perovskite uh, pv technology you can find it here also in general on tin film pv you can find more information here and there's also a running european project uh, on uh, upscaling perovskite uh, solar cell uh, technologies in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention and you can address your questions always also at this email uh, address. Thanks again and hope to talk to you too soon about this promising technology. So I introduce you to Bert Verman. He is uh, working at the University of Hasselt in the same part of Paris Kites and uh, he's going to give the next steps in uh, perovskites working Bart has been all over the world uh, he has uh, been working at several places in the world uh, or in in europe in uh, scandinavia uh, and he has got a very career uh, uh, fellowship at Uppsala, uh, and he has a he has got a erc grant he's uh, so he's top of the bill in perovskites and all the uh, further materials that are coming along. Bart, the floor is yours. So in the last presentation, Tom has been focusing on using perovskite on silicon in a tandem approach. In this presentation, I'm going to have a look if we can combine perovskite with an other thin film PV material. And that will be Schalke tonight, very clear from this um, title. My approach will be very straightforward. First, having a look at the market. In that market, is there a good match? And then combining that good match, Schalke United with Provskite, where are we in tandem approaches? Such a full or alt-in-film tandem PV product 
which for example be very beneficial for building integrated PV products as you might imagine. Here you see the um, production, the annual production of PV, photovoltaic, starting in 2000 and then exponential growth to 2018. You see in blue a lot of silicon and in green some tin film PV. About 5% of the market is tin film PV. And in those 5%, we have three materials. Amorphous silicon on a decline, uh, two chalcogenides, cotton tellurite in light blue, and copper indium gallium diselenide in orange. It's on this CIGES we're going to focus, which is a material where European research institutes and some companies are focusing on. So there's quite some research in Europe. And it's on the incline, as you can see. Also for 2018 and 2019, those were very positive years for CIGES as well. 2000, end of 2019, beginning of 2020 was something different, as you might imagine. This year probably will not be that positive. Um, but that will not only be for this industry and this topic that might be worldwide and for quite some industries. It's only 5% of the market, unfortunately. So there was last year the white paper initiative taken by several research institutes and companies from Europe. It was European, Europe, European led. Um, you can find the complete white paper initiative on this website where all the advantages and pros are of CIGES are communicated. And here you see a quick overview. Let's go through it. Um, it's a thin film material, so that already has quite some advantages. It can achieve high efficiencies, as we will see on the next slide, but also energy yield and reliability are quite positive and comparable to uh, silicon technologies, commercially available silicon technologies. Application-wise, several applications can be um, aimed at because we can play, there's quite some flexibility. We can play with color, pattern, flexible um, substrates can be used and so on. It can be low cost if at gigawatt scale. That's a difficulty, of course. Many of the companies, as you might imagine from last slide, are not really at gigawatt scale. Why low cost? Because of vertical integration. It's a thin film material, so not a lot of material is being used, which means that the energy payback time and the carbon footprint are also more uh, beneficial, more positive as compared to silicon, as was the case for Provskite as well, and already discussed by Tom during the last presentation. Again, for more details, please have a look at the white paper initiative. Efficiency-wise, this is an insert of the um, NRL chart that was already introduced by Tom, where you have the thin film technologies and then in the solid green dot or circle CIGES, which is over here, and an efficiency of 23.4% has been achieved by Solar Frontier. So cell level, we are at 23.4%, 23 which is quite high, competitive with silicon. Module level, there's more room for improvement at this moment. Best module is 19.2%. If you now look at the section, the category of emerging PV, there's also a very recent branch of Proskite on CIGES tandem, two terminal monolithic, which is the open square in orange, which you see over there. Also in this case, HZB has achieved the highest efficiency of 24.2 or 24.16%. So very clearly, this chalcogenite is indeed Interesting to be combined with Provskite in a tandem approach. Why? Well, here you see the structure, the crystal structure of CIGES or chalcopyrite, chalcopyrite crystal structure, um, which is some kind of zinc blend structure, zinc blend structure, but at some of the lattice sites, they can be indium or gallium. And it's not a 50-50% distribution. Typically, the gallium on gallium plus indium ratio it's more somewhere between 30 and 40%, so there's less gallium as compared to indium. Bottom line is the most important. We can play with the amount of indium and gallium, or gallium. And that's beneficial because that means we can tune the band gap. As you can see here, we see the band gap as a function of composition and also lattice constant. But we're going to focus on the composition. For pure gallium, copper gallium deselenides, band gap is around 1.7 electron volts. For pure indium, copper indium selenides, it's around one electron volt. And especially that material might be very interesting because here you see the total tandem efficiency for the bottom band gap, the cell, the band gap of the bottom cell as a function of the band gap of the top cell, two terminal and four terminal. 
Now, if we would normally use silicon as a bottom cell, silicon is only one material, silicon, and only has one band gap of 1.1 electron volt. Which means, first of all, the, the theoretically highest efficiencies cannot be achieved. Second of all, if you still want to go for the highest efficiency, you need a top cell, so a perovskite cell, of 1.7 of to 1.8 electron volt. And also in the perovskite world, the best efficiencies are achieved for the lower band gaps, so over here. For those perovskites, it is possible to go for high tandem efficiencies if we have a bottom cell of around 1 electron volt, which we do. Copper indium deselenite has a band gap of around 1 electron volt. So that's now really an advantage as compared to silicon. Using these thin film materials, we can aim for higher efficiencies thanks to the combination of those two band gaps, but also thanks to a better efficiency for the perovskite top cell. This is also the case for the four terminal tandem efficiency, except that everything is a bit more spread out over here. Where is the CIGS material, the copper indium desalinate material? At this moment, highest efficiency is 19.2%, achieved by EMPA, Switzerland. There's a reason we started a new initiative, a new project funded by the European Commission, the Horizon 2020 program, combining Provskite and CIS in tandems, per SysTent, Provskite, CIS tandem, focusing on four terminal, as you can see in this graph, because we still can learn a lot from the four terminal approach, combining all the best research institutes we could think of. So for example, EMPA you see back, we ourselves are very good in Provskites, but mainly all these institutes do have quite some experience, both in Provskites and CIGS. We also have two companies on board, Solaronics and SME working on Provskites, Nice Solar Energy, and an industrial partner working on Chalcogenites. We're thinking on the long term, so we're also working on techno-economic and life cycle assessment, wherefore we have Vito and University of Hasselt on board, which means we have three Energyville partners, IMEC, Vito and University of Hasselt. And this was one of the first European calls where people were asking, where the European Commission was asking to look over the border of Europe as well. So we brought in some non-Europeans and we went quite far. We went to Australia for ANU, the Australian National University, and we went to the States for NREL, who is, for example, um, generating the, the world record charts for uh, solar cell efficiencies, as you know. This project is funded within this call, the REST1 call, um, aiming at next generation PV technologies. It has a budget of 5 million euros, and with those 5 million euros, we aim for a tandem cell efficiency of more than 30% and a tandem module efficiency of around 25%, which means that our top cell needs to be around 20%, our semi-transparent perovskite top cell around 20%, and all the light that goes through has still to be able to generate around 10% in the CIS bottom cell. Focus on glass, we can still learn a lot on glass first. With high stability, it's important if you think about perovskite, Manufacturability, everything should be upscalable up to 20 by 20 square centimeter at least. Low cost, low environmental footprint, footprint. Had already mentioned that's about the life cycle assessment and the techno-economic analysis, which both have to be at least comparable to silicon at the end of the project. That's what we would call a success. Where are we right now? Well, best efficiency we obtained is around 25% in a four terminal approach on a rigid substrate, so on glass. That's the beauty of the project. We are combining top cells and bottom cells from different partners who are very well equipped for Provskites and CIGS. So we can just combine the best top cells with the best bottom cells. For example, for this 25%, the top cell came from TNO and the bottom cell came from EMPA. So a 16.9% top cell plus an 8.1% bottom cell gave a total efficiency of 25%. For more information, please have a look at this advanced energy materials paper where the whole um, tandem stack is being explained in more detail. Also on flexible, also for terminal, we have a world record for the moment. There, our partner TNO partnered up with Mia Soleil, an uh, American company. So TNO 
delivered the top cell, MIA-C delivered the bottom cell, and both together achieved a 23% efficiency for flexible, which is a world record for flex flexible photovoltaic cells. So this brings me back to the original title of my talk, um, Perovskite and Chalkage Is this a marriage made in heaven? Well, I would say at this moment they are dating. There is still some promise, some progress to be made, but it looks already quite promising. There is a better match with perovskite in terms of band gap. So this means we do not have to date with the same kind of perovskite as silicon is doing. That's a good thing, I would say. We can go for lower band gap perovskite, which typically also have higher efficiencies. We already achieved quite some good results, um, both on two thermal and four thermal, both on rigid and flexible. Last two were obtained with the, within our persistent European project. And also on two thermal flexible, there is an, probably an European project in the pipeline. More information will follow soon, hopefully in a few months maximum. I would also like to focus your attention on some other European projects we have ongoing, because from those projects, we also will be using and learn quite some know-how that can be applied here. There is the ERC grant, Uniting PV, my ERC grant, where we have been working on cell architectures, advanced cell architectures for thin film PV, using ideas from Silicon World, um, optical and electric optimization of cells. These new architectures can also be used and will also be used for our Schalkers and bottom cells and tandem approaches. This bottom tandem cell is still copper indium selenide, so it still contains indium, and indium and gallium, unfortunately, are on the list of critical raw materials. So we should try to avoid them on the long term. That's also something we are working on. We are working on replacements. And, and the typical example is copper, zinc, tin, selenide or sulfide, castorite. That's a material we're also working on. Uh, it was the key point or the focus of our swing project in the past, and it will be the focus of our custom R project led by IREC from Spain, which will start in probably October 2020. And then the last project I would like to refer to is a project I would call Tandem to the Extreme, where we have a Schalkers Night top cell with a very high band gap so that it absorbs in the UV region and a bottom cell, an organic bottom cell, that only absorbs in the infrared region. Both of them are transparent for the visible region, which means we get a technology for windows. We get, in the end, a transparent photovoltaic device or a window. That's tech for win started beginning of 2019 um, and is still running as well. Of course, I would like to acknowledge the European Union for all the money we get to be able to do research. And I would also like to focus your attention on the progress in the photovoltaic tandem technology LinkedIn group. If you want to stay up to date about tandem technology development, then please send me a request to join this Facebook, uh, this LinkedIn group, and we will keep you up to date. Weekly, we are putting interesting information within this group. So the progress in photovoltaic tandem technology LinkedIn group. Thank you for your attention. And if you still have questions, you can contact us via info at energyville.be. Just drop us a line and we will answer your question as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Uh, very interesting. And uh, yeah, it's uh, as always, it, with two on a tandem, you move faster than with one on a bike. Uh, that's the old question, I guess. <laughs>